Hey, so uh, hi all of you. Today we are joined by Sneha. Uh, Sneha is currently working at, at Invite as a design researcher and interaction designer. So Sneha design begins with asking the right questions, evolves through close collaboration with communities involved, formulating on the drawing board and results in delivering value and meaning to end users. Sneha has a hybrid design background uh, in uh, UX research, interaction design, and in industrial design with six plus years of experience working with organizations like Godridge, Accenture, Frog, um, and serving industries like FinTech, healthcare, retail, education, and hospitality. Sneha, thank you so much for doing this for us today. Uh, it's a pleasure to have you. Over to you. Yeah, I'm super excited as well. Thank you all of y'all for like coordinating this and like onboarding alumni to participate. This has been fun working with you guys. And hopefully the session would be useful for at least some of y'all. So I'm going to share my screen. I, we still have people joining in. So hello, everyone. I'm Sneha, whoever just joined. <laughs> Let me know if you guys... Are uh, looking at our welcome batch screen. Okay, perfect. Okay. Um, also, give me a heads up anytime if you can't hear me or like raise your hand or whatever. No, I mean, don't raise your hand actually, but just let me know if there's something you want me to repeat because I know like audio can be a bit wonky on Zoom. So where I'm always happy to go back and forth. But as the slide says, welcome batch of 2020. As you guys just described, your year has been quite woggly. So uh, let's try and help you with just a little bit of sharing from what actually happens in the real world and like what jobs look like and what design looks like when you're practicing it with organizations. Um, as Purva mentioned, uh, the, uh, the topic today that we'll be talking about is hybrid design. Uh, and this is high level, uh, plan for what we're going to do in the next hour, hour and a half. We have three sections, uh, which I'd like to walk through. First is what is hybrid design? You know, what are its benefits? Why I personally chose to become one. Uh, second is about uh, team structures and hybrid projects. So what do hybrid projects look like? Uh, how do you, what are your, uh, what is your role in terms of like the extended team that you work with? And the third section is more directed towards your roles and responsibilities as a hybrid designer. And we'll also cover a little bit about how to look for a hybrid design job, if that's something any of you might be interested in. Uh, and as you can see, I've added like a Q&A after every section. So I don't want us to like wait right till the end and have like a Q&A. Like feel free to ask me question, obviously anytime during the presentation, but we also have like dedicated like 10 or 15 minutes uh, at the end of every section so that I can answer any questions y'all might have pertaining to that particular topic. So any questions before I jump in, before we start? Okay, I, I see some nods and thumbs up. Okay, I'm gonna <laughs> move ahead. So first question I have for you guys actually, so let's, let's start with how many of you have already conducted design research or have like had research roles or even hybrid roles in the past. Maybe use like the chat, Zoom chat to just say me or just say yes or no, if, if that's not the case. How do I see chat? Okay, I see, okay, design research not outside school. Okay, I see some responses. Yes, nope. <laughs> cool. Okay, for whoever already has this experience, this is typically the folks you go to after the end of this presentation to get more information or these are the guys I'll also reach out to if I cannot answer any of your questions. Um, and the second question is, if you've not done this before, but um, have any of you read about it and are actually interested in pursuing a career as a hybrid designer? Same, let's, let's see if there is like a yes, a why, or does anyone just want to specialize in something? Yeah, half and half is also okay. We can do 50-50, <laughs> you're still considering it. 
big thumbs up from Purva. Yes, from Vanessa. Okay. Interested. I see some interested. Awesome. Well, thanks guys for participating. So hopefully for all of y'all who are actually interested in hybrid design, we'll, we'll get to learn a little bit more about it. And anyone else who's just curious and not sure and in that 50-50 mode, um, let's hope your, uh, your questions are also answered. So let's start with the first section. Let's jump to that, um, hybrid design or hybrid designer. So hybrid designers are generally also called generalists. They are called unicorns. Uh, they're called people, essentially jack of all trades. On the other side, hybrids are also called like, oh, they're not specialist or they're like jack of all trades, but ace of none. So it, it, it has its own advantages and disadvantages. And depending on which organization or what team you end up working in, it can be an asset or it can actually be something that's working against you. Against you. Uh, but the way I look at hybrid design is basically it's the ability to solve problems through different lenses. So one of the most famous uh, definitions of design itself out there is problem solving, right? Like all of us are looked at, oh, this is a designer. We are all problem solvers. We identify with that. But what hybrid design helps you do is that it helps you solve those problems just from like different lenses. And for me, those lenses happen to be UX research and interaction design. So whenever any challenge or an issue or a web design problem is put forth, I try to look at it from like a research perspective and then try to solve it from like an interaction design perspective. That is my version of hybrid. Having said that, each of y'all can obviously have your own versions of hybrid. Some of y'all could be content strategists and interaction designers. Y'all could be interaction designers and partial front-end developers. So everyone's version of what generalist or what hybrid you are can be something you can uh, kind of identify for yourself or go on embark on that journey to find out what hybrid you are, if that's something you're interested in. Um, also, another uh, stuff I found out was that hybrids make great freelancers because you avoid interdependency. You're not necessarily have to wait for someone else. Okay, this guy is going to give me mock-ups and I'm going to put visuals on it or, you know, I'm just going to do mock-ups, do some research, but somebody else is going to put the final visuals and typography and make those decisions. So if you're able to manage the end-to-end -end spectrum, you're a great asset as a freelancer. You can do absolutely anything just by yourself. Another thing it works is it works really well with design agencies and small to mid-sized companies. And if, if you've looked at my profile, this is these are the two kind of companies I've mostly been associated with. Um, so it's also because these are so agencies or small to mid sized mid size organizations are always they don't have necessarily have all the resources to hire like a hundred person design team right so it's mostly five or ten people depending on the size and these guys are like have their hands into a dot of different projects and they're playing different roles so it works in your favor on the opposite side however I know like really big big tech companies who have like 200 plus designers on their team, they have dedicated assets just for usability testing, for example, or just to conduct like interaction or just to you know produce interaction designs. So it really depends, I guess, when you're looking for that job to identify that right organization where you can use your hybrid skills. Okay, having said that, Let's let's just I wanted to like share a little bit about why I chose to be hybrid design. Um, and one of the first reasons was as an interaction designer, I was actually literally unable to design without establishing a connection with my user. So when when I was at Frogs, for example, I even though I was like a hybrid designer, but when I was given when sometimes the client just came to us like, oh, we here are your user stories. We just want you to build that website. And I was like, I, it's, it's not possible to like just create something based on like one sentence. Like I, I, do, I know who the user is, but I've never spoken to them. I don't know, understand what their needs and requirements are. More importantly, even though you will probably design something because you know how to design, it's an interaction design job. It's hard to kind of connect with your own design and then share that with someone else. Like it's hard to logically be like, oh, why did I use this interaction versus the other one? Because you don't necessarily have the context of the problem. 
the one way to solve it obviously is to ask for those market research or ask for any kind of data about the user from your client but it in the end it didn't feel like satisfactory for me personally and the other reason was also when i was doing like a a, a hardcore research job and this was back in india um, what used to happen is i used to go on these three four long month long research projects like field projects and then it was super fun and we came up came back with amazing insights and created these reports and then that's it it was like a dead end like there would be these reports with like insights and design principles and everything and they would just not translate like I, we would see them somewhere in like marketing collaterals or you know on social media that this and so and so accenture conducted like extensive research and stuff like that but it would never see the light of the day and personally for me that was extremely frustrating because i was like i can actually show you the value of those words by converting them and translating them into interesting you know services or products or whatever that might be so i think my love for like translating that those user insights into his design is what made me realize that okay i think i'm i'm meant to be that generalist at least for now i enjoy it um and then of course obviously because i enjoy that end to end process as well so this this is actually a funny old memory so when i was at cca and back then we used to have a what is it called end of year jury i don't know if you guys have that in december do you guys no no okay uh, we had that at the end of the three semesters they are made us like present our top three projects from that year to a mixed panel from the industry and our professors and as part of that presentation at the beginning we had to give like an intro of what who we are as designers and you know what our journey has been and i remember doodling this uh this version and i was like okay this is me uh, for some reason i associate myself with superheroes uh, but essentially i have this toolkit and i have the maker skills as an industrial designer uh, i really wanted to work on social impact projects be it like financial inclusion or healthcare or special needs um i had like i said design research background in india and then at cca i had learned interaction design so i was like okay this is my toolkit and this has been my journey and i want to look for a job that allows me to tap into at least some of these if not all uh, you know tools or skills and i think that really helped put me myself in a frame of mind which helped me find the right kind of job for myself right so for after doing this for that presentation i was like i i actually liked what i did there and i got good feedback from the professor so i went back and i started kind of identifying what that hybrid role would look like for me when i'm looking for a job and what i did is i put like one skill set user research i mean one role and then the other i put in as interaction design and i just like mapped out the various skills i think i i thought back then that i had pertaining to each of them and then any time i was looking for a job i would try to see if they were looking for someone with these skill sets right so let's do one thing i wanted all of you all if you all are would be interested anyone who's interested in hybrid if not if you all want to just specialize in one role just just put that um and then just list out some skills that you think you have feel free to also list out skills that you think you, you would should be learning for that particular role So I think Purva has a Figma board set up for that. Purva, do you want to share it in the chat? I just did. If oh, okay. We, if anybody can't access, let me know. Okay, I'm gonna go in there. Okay, I see some people playing around. also feel free to add another role if you're you if you're you consider yourself a hybrid of three or four different roles that's always welcome more the merrier try to think of like new skills that you've learned at cca skills that you think you already had while you were whatever your previous job or previous uh, education has been a people okay for anybody who's just joined in i'm going to drop in a link again yeah for if people have just joined in hello everyone i'm sneha we're talking about hybrid design and then we're trying to see if anyone 
here is interested in mapping out what kind of hybrid designer they are. So the link that Purva shared, it has this template. So grab one and maybe write down the roles you would be interested in. It could be interaction design, design research, coding, front-end development, content strategy, marketing, sales, anything, dream big. Well, can I think even use something like this as a reference uh, for your moonshot projects? Do you all do you all have that? Does Sharon did Sharon make you guys do that moonshot project? Okay, so you all can use the roles that you think for yourself here and try and see if the skills you have match whatever the description is in that moonshot project job description. this another two, three minutes, I guess. You can see some people have, awesome, they have three, the hybrids of three, that is so cool. Okay, look at that. I see a lot of project managers here, future PMs in the house. Amazing. I am so curious. I see like a four quadrangle. Nice. So as you guys are building, I see some already forming. If any, any volunteers, anyone wants to go and share what their thought process was when they were building this for themselves? Any speakers or do you guys want me to pick one now? <laughs> You're graduating in December. You guys need to start speaking up. I think the hybrid I've made, um, I'm not <laughs> sure whether that it, that role exists. Um, okay. Can you, sorry, can you point me where you are? Just absolutely. It's, it's the second one. Um, okay, perfect. Okay, let's zoom on that. Okay, go. Cool. So um, content strategy, I'm really interested in because I see it as the, the design of stories um, rather than the story of design. So oftentimes in at least at CCA and all of our research projects, um, uh, there's, there's been storytelling needed to actually explain the design process. Right. So in that, in that context, you're really telling the story of how you got to your design. Um, but in content strategy, the way I see it is basically, how do you craft an actual narrative? How do, you, how do you craft the actual story? How do you craft the actual everything that's written down and how that all weaves together? Mm -hmm. um, so that I'm really interested in. And then, you know, I have some sort of, um, I have ex expertise in filmmaking in, in um, you know, just other types of visual design, whether it relates to photography or things like that. Um, which I would classify as art direction, but I'm not really sure whether there is a role out there that combines both of these. <laughs> if there is none, you can like make one for yourself. You can be like a pioneer for this kind of a hybrid. And maybe next year, come back and give us lecture for the next cohort on how to be a content <laughs> strategist and art director hybrid. Cool. <laughs> but it's interesting in my, uh, when I was working at Frog, there was another colleague who was working in India um, and I mean, he was an interaction designer, but he had done some co a course on filmmaking in LA and uh, as, uh, along with his like 
daily work work what he did was once a week he produced this like news like trends in design and he used all his like storytelling uh, you know his not not like his skill set of storytelling and creating content and made this like uh, amazing videos that he would launch every week just to get in, uh, like other designers inspired so like just letting you know there's a lot of experiments you can do out there even if you feel like you're stuck in a job that doesn't allow you to do utilize the skill set you can always find a way awesome okay any any other any other if you want to share or do we move ahead test i see you written quite oh i <laughs> did okay um yeah i don't know if i i kind of just went all over the place with this one um but i was thinking about it a lot from our check-ins too and i really um would love to somehow like yeah blend design and research and arts and research and my eventual long term goal has always been to be a creative director or design director of some sort but the mm -hmm. path to get there I've always been less certain about and under which design like subject discipline that will fall whether it's more product focused like or more like my background like visual and graphic focused or like how to okay. bring in research and I like research so much and so I one of the reasons I joined the program was like well I thought interaction and product design did involve more research and so being able to eventually become a design director with that sort of like background and toolkit would be my ideal. Um, but still very out the path to get there. I, I love your final goal. I feel like <laughs> it's so it's so amazing to see someone have that clarity, like where they want to end up. So oh, I'm sure it'll change a lot along the way. <laughs> Fine. It, this is the goal for now, and we'll stick to it at least yeah. for today. <laughs> that's exactly how I feel. I'm like this is the goal for now, and that's what we're doing. Yeah. <laughs> stay 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 on it at least for today yeah yeah for today <laughs> thanks guys thanks for whoever was able to put something there hopefully like i said it will be helpful for you guys when you go into job search mode uh but this this is another uh another tool if you may that i used personally after i did this exercise so after i doodled this for myself and i started interviewing uh i realized i wanted to find out some way to map out the skill set that i had and incidentally uh, in one of our industrial visits to frog design uh, i remember one designer showing us some, something very similar they called it like the spider web or something like that and then i looked it up and it's called like skill mapping so you can put up all the skills that you guys just wrote in this section and you can actually try and see if you all can rate yourself or rank yourself uh on that so for example like design thinking or interaction design like you know and like just try and see okay if it is like 30 30 90 where am i right and sometimes you can be like i'm i'm up to the brim i'm like the perfect at it and that can be like sometimes you have to show up for it like show off during interviews that's why you see you can see that i've like really up to my skill but that not might might not be true uh but try and do this for yourself uh So A, it helps you recognize your own skill set. So it helps you like really uh, map out what are the different skills that you think you have. What are your strengths, your weaknesses? It helps you also identify. Okay, I'm not that good at visual design. That is something maybe if I'm interested in, I need to really uh, buckle up and you know learn more about and take more initiatives. Um, another thing it helps is it helps the hiring manager. So what I did when I went for my interviews is that along with my resume. i had like a print out version of this as well um and then how it helps is that when you when they're looking at a team composition there are already three for example three designers on their team but they're all they most of them are like visually focused but they were always looking for someone who has like design thinking experience or has that experience about you know of system thinking has that side to them they would hire me because they identified that uh skill set within me so when you're going for interviews there'll be like 10 other people along with you with almost similar qualifications experiences this can actually help you like help them understand the layers you have within yourself as an interaction designer and it actually help them identify that yes you are the right candidate so i don't know if we have time for that purva uh, seha and a quick have... question about your skill map oh. um so um isn't that very very subjective as in it's just the mapping which you are doing according to your own understanding of your own self and it really yes. might not be describing 
the skills, the way somebody else is perceiving. I'm giving an analogy of um, we see a lot of design resumes where people uh, put in those bars, like the rating bars of people, like how much I know Adobe or like how much I know um, Sketch. And somebody has uh, put the slider somewhere in the middle, somewhere, somewhere in the uh, bottom half and things like that. And all of that is pretty much criticized because nobody really can know Adobe like Photoshop for like and be like an eight on 10 and kind of slide there and say I'm an eight on 10 because that's so subjective. Um, so I'm just trying to understand that does this mapping give a real picture um, of you as a person or does it help the decorating team to understand where you fit in? Which one would be the case for this? I think both more so for like, like I said, for the hiring manager, at least that's what I heard when I shared this. Uh, and then the, the team that was interviewing me at Frog, they like, this was cool. It helped us like identify um, that you have some experience with design thinking. But to your point of like, this can be subjective. I think that's, that's very honest. That is really true that it can be subjective. Like what makes me say that I, you know, I'm putting at myself three, at on, three on system yeah. thinking three on, yeah. three on system thinking or storytelling but one way to actually back that is then through your portfolio so this is part like i said it's part of my resume and it's you know it's part of that but when i go for an interview i'm not just showing them my resume or my you know this this chart i'm actually showing them two or three projects and when i did that in my portfolio as well i have those skills jotted down so for project a i honed in honed in on my like storytelling uh, you know skill set mm -hmm. or my prototyping skill set and then of course they are the judge if you know when i say i'm good at prototyping if they can actually see that in my project and and the work that i've delivered it has to obviously match. So even though you're self-analyzing it for yourself, always remember that to back it up with some work or some project work or some kind of you know evidence, if that makes sense. Got it, thanks. So any other questions? Let me stop. Um, again, yeah, how are we on time? Because I think we had uh, We can quickly go through the other one, like maybe in five minutes, wrap it up. Sure. Oh, I don't know why I stopped sharing. But yeah, go back to the Figma and there is another um, skill mapping there for you guys. So I'm going to try and go back to it. We don't have to do it for like all the 10 skills. You feel free to do that later uh, when you guys have the time. Uh, just do it maybe for one, two or three top skills that you all have already listed in the previous exercise and see if that's helpful. And then maybe just put like dots here. You don't have to sit and color the triangles. Also, if, if there is any point where you feel like you're unable to rate yourself or like analyze your own skill sets. Uh, I'm sure you guys are putting like diets and triads. Use one of those times to actually share what you're thinking of your own skills and like share it with your team members, get their feedback being like, oh, I think I really am good at uh, storytelling or I actually lack visual design skills. What do you guys think? Here's my work. So like share with others and maybe help each other as well to identify where you can rate yourself in that skill set. I think the way it has helped me as well personally inwardly is also like, this is not what it looked like for me five years ago, right? When I like just started off. So it's also interesting to just see year on year how you've developed or what skills you've been able to learn more about. Uh I have a question over here. I think it's related to uh, how we rate ourselves. Is it just the, the is, it, is it for us to see how confident we are or is it how, again, like uh, to have a, as an interview, they might see it as a different way of actually imposing, right? If I'm good at visuals, I feel like I'm really great at it. But at the end of the time, same, I mean, at the same time, what if the people who are at the interview might not see that that's the greatest skill that you have? Hmm. 
So, I mean, if that sorry, makes any sense. Yeah, so you're saying what if like somebody says that oh you've you've ranked yourself high but doesn't feel like you have that skill set, right? Yeah, exactly. So my that's point, always yeah. that's okay, especially for interviews. I feel like even without this map, there would be a lot of people when you go in for interviews, they look at your project and be like, this could have been so much better. And I've always personally just taken that as feedback. So if they tell you, oh, you've ranked yourself at level three for visual, but that doesn't show up in your work, ask them like okay, cool. Like, what is the feedback? Where, where, how do you think I can improve? Because like I said, this is just right. like a self-analysis. You can always be like, I thought of myself there, but it's great that you guys are now giving me feedback. I know better where I rank myself in the industry and I'm always happy to learn, right? So just like take it positively and always be open and flexible to changing things up on this map. It's, it's not set in stone. It's for your reference. Yeah, thanks a lot. That was helpful. Uh, Sneha, the skill map is developed by you or is it like a framework which you got? It is a out? framework. It is a framework. And in my resources, uh, I've added a deck, not a deck, sorry, a, an article about someone explaining this in more in detail. So it was developed by? Um, I'm not sure who exactly developed it. I remember... Uh, looking it up on like similar articles where people have just written about it, just like how design thinking is like mm -hmm. IDO started it, but people have developed their own versions of it. So I'm not sure exactly where this originated from. Got it. I have a question. Um, yeah. Do you ever, like, do you send the same map to every job or do you look at like the keywords in the job posting and kind of like change it to help I don't know, like help cater it to what they actually need? I did, I did. So some of, so when you look at this chart, I mean, there are some quite common skills like interaction design, visual design, prototyping, but then uh, communication, for example, or data visualization. So there are some, not exactly soft skills, but probably like secondary um, or parallel skills that you feel free to like change it up or it's not even about changing, it's using the words that they have in the job description. So mm -hmm. if they are calling it data visualization, use that. If they're calling it visual communication, use that. So that, because they understand that word and they refer to that. So always feel free to change it up to match uh, whatever description is provided there. Okay. That's a great tip. That's a really good insight. Thank you for I that. I think that's also true for your portfolios. Like I remember when, um, we were doing portfolio reviews. Um, I heard this a lot as well, where they were like, if you're going for an interview, always like maybe make some updates on your portfolio to cater it to whoever you're interviewing with. I, I, I also know to the other extreme where I knew people had three versions of their portfolio, like one which was specific to like visual design only and like one which was more hybrid or interaction design focused. So it really depends on um, how customized you want to be during your interviews. That translates to, I think, three different websites, right? Yeah, <laughs> essentially <laughs> that. But I think the projects are same. You just like highlight the one over the other and stuff like that. But um, I think we're done with that. Uh, yeah, I think the question, feel free to ask questions as we, unless someone wants to share their skill map. Um, I'm always curious to see how you guys have interpreted it. Maybe we can do a couple. Oh, quickly, just like two. Any any volunteers this time? Anyone who's not gone before? I um I don't really want to talk about it because I'm still a little <laughs> I'm still thinking about it, and uh, I think what uh, was just asked was really helpful for me about um, changing it depending on the role, but also um, I don't. Uh, I think the, what, the bit I'm struggling with is also the difference between like hard skills and soft skills. So mm -hmm. whether I would want to, you know, differentiate those when I'm trying to just map it out for myself. Um, it's a really interesting exercise to get reflective about. So I, I don't really want to <laughs> talk about mine. Mine's the red one, but if you're curious. But um, okay. I also think I would benefit from just more layers because I feel like it's hard to, to uh, I feel, I feel like I'm trying, I'm putting too many, yeah. Too much, too much data, trying to share too Can much to one map. 
We can hear you. Or oh, not anymore. I missed your response, sorry. No, I said I, that's that's completely understandable. I like your idea of adding more layers. You can, I've seen versions of this, which is more color coded. It's also like split like half and half, or like you said, hard skills versus soft skills, or like, you know, research skill has one and then interaction or visual design has another completely mm -hmm. different, uh, you know, octagon or whatever uh, map for itself. So yeah. I feel like use this more as a foundation and then build as much as you want and you know, build it, build in as many layers as you want. Um, you can, I've even seen, I mean, I've not seen it, but I've tried it actually using it to tell my design's journey as well, right? Like I mm -hmm. used it to like, I started as an industrial designer. I started gaining these skills. I put in like a bigger wedge and I was like, became a researcher and skill, learned all these skills, another wedge and interaction design and learned all these skills. So right. I feel like you can, um, kind of morph it into any direction you yeah. want to take it and use it during your interview process. Just use it as your personal tool to tell whatever story you want to. Yeah, that's super interesting and helpful. Thanks. Yeah. Glad you guys enjoyed it. Anyone else before we, or any other questions, even if you don't want to share, just curious. Uh, I had one more question. <laughs> Yeah, that's cool. Um, when you talk about being a hybrid designer, like, and you touched on this earlier, it seems like clearly that looks different for everyone, and it looks different in every organization or company. Um, so, just as far as terminology goes, is that something? Is that the way people talk about it, or is it up to us to really just sh showcase what we mean by this term? And uh, I'm just curious what what that looks like in the working world, because yeah. yeah. So I have never seen the term hybrid design in any job description. I think it's more of something I like to call myself, but I've, um, neither have I seen people call, uh, gen call someone generalist or unicorns in a job description. I think uh, in job description, it's more formal where they'll have those two or three design titles that they want you to hold, right? Like whether it's UX research plus interaction design or visual design and front end developer. So they'll, they'll specify what is that hybrid that they're looking for. Okay, yeah. Yeah, because it always feels like we're applying for one title, but I guess it's up to us to show um, how we could be multiple things. Exactly. And sometimes I've also seen like, they'll just mention interaction design, but if you read the description, there is so much responsibility around research or even like, you know, visual design or graphic design, and they need help with logos and illustrations. So when it's up to, I guess, what happens I think is also because sometimes people who write this description aren't, are not designers. So they don't exactly know what encompasses becoming an interaction designer, what it means to be a content strategist. I feel like we always know more because we've practiced that in like schools or offices or wherever. So it's, we can always like let the recruiter know it's like, you know, I can actually do all of this, but as a graphic designer or as a visual designer as well. So, yeah. Awesome. Thanks. You're welcome. Any more questions? Ooh, why am I sharing? Screen? Any more questions? Anyone else feel, or you can also add it to the chat during the presentation. Oh, I have one more. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I've seen and like replied to some jobs where it seems like interaction, the user experience is like what the recruiter really understands or like is looking for. And sometimes if I look, I feel like if I put interaction designer, it goes above their head. Do you feel that's true? Or like, what, do you have any tips for that? Like following that? Is it better to like just sell yourself as a UX designer? Yeah, I guess. That is absolutely true. I think the word user experience design, interaction design, I like there are just so many terminologies floating around for us that it can get confusing. Um, I think that's why uh, don't get hung up on that title of what they're offering. Like I kept saying, like uh, read the description. I think that will give you a better synopsis of what they mean by that user experience designer. Right. Mm -hmm. Sometimes they call it that, but they're not necessarily aware that it means interaction design. Right. They're actually just they're looking for a specialized visual designer only. 
right? But they're calling them user experience designer. You won't okay. necessarily do any research or even make any mockups and stuff like that. You would be responsible for making that final visual designs, right? Mm -hmm. But they're calling it user experience design or even product design. I've, I've like that name has also started to come up. So mm -hmm. don't get bogged down by what's in the title. Just read the description and then identify, try and understand what they're trying to say sometimes. Yeah, I also like think of it as like in the title of your LinkedIn profile, like mm -hmm. I've changed the title a bunch of times because I'm like, how am I coming across in general, you know? And like, how does that affect who finds me, you know? Yeah. Um, yeah, I think about that a lot too. I don't know if that's the same, but. That is actually interesting because you, I mean, it, then it goes into how uh, LinkedIn algorithms actually work and what words they pick up on. So maybe use some, use one, like you're using product design in your title, but in your own description, like your bio, try and use some other words so that at least you have like all that keywords somewhere in your description, your bio and your title. Also in your, uh, it's helpful to update your own uh, experience on your LinkedIn. So like for one job, you were the product designer. At Frog, I was the interaction designer. Now at Invita, I'm an interaction designer. No, no I'm, a, I'm a product designer and researcher. So it's like, just keep all those keywords there so that whoever the recruiter is, if they're reading it, they know you've had all those different rules, uh, roles, sorry. Okay, thank you, that's helpful. Yeah, but that's actually a very nice question. And maybe Kristen, Kristen Yuan, I'm sure you guys have met her, you met her. She might have more to share in depth how LinkedIn algorithms work and what's the best terminology like to use to get noticed. But any other questions before we jump in to next section? Questions are great. Like these are really good questions. Thanks, guys. Thanks, guys. Yeah, keep moving. Okay, now let's just talk about design teams and hybrid projects. Uh, so, I think this uh, is more to the question that we were just looking at. Like design teams, they're called design teams. We're called UX teams. We're called product design teams. So, depending on what team you are on, your that would be your title, right? So. So yeah, that would be your title. If you're on a product design team, you'd be called a product designer. If you're on a user experience team, you'll be called a user experience designer. So uh, I, at, after some point, I think the titles just don't matter. But of course, when you're looking for a job, I'm sure it plays an important role. Um, but what any of these team actually looks like is that you have a UX designer or an interaction designer who's responsible for interactions, is responsible for layouts, workflows. Then there's a visual designer who's more focused on style guide, typography, visual components, logos, etc. Um, then you have a user re experience researcher, so who's responsible for insights, user needs, uh, use case scenarios, user stories, and actually just like advocating for users. Um, and then I'm sure there are like other team members depending on the type of role you have, uh, but this, there is a composition of designers there. And then you have your PMs. They represent the business side of it. They'll talk about revenue, business goal, your target user group, et cetera. You have the front end engineers or the developers who are obviously responsible for bringing to life whatever it is that you've created. Um, and as you can see in the parenthesis there, I have make them your best friend, like literally. And I don't mean like superficially, like, oh, I know, I know the developer on our team. Like make them your best friend. I think that would be the most useful for you. Uh, if I did just quickly share something, I think what happens is there's always this bias amongst designers that like, oh, engineers, they're going to like strip down all my design and be like, it's not feasible. And, you know, I'm going to end up creating crap because of them. And I don't know where this bias stems from, but I've seen it in a lot of designers. Um, and it feels like it's time to like overcome them. These guys are so helpful. And nowadays there are just so many uh, libraries available that everyone wants to experiment. Um, and the reason why I say make them your best friend is like what happens is if you design in a bubble, like you've got requirements from the PM, you've done some research and created this amazing, uh, you know, website, like it has the best in class features, it, it follows all the best practices. And then you give it to the developer and they're like, oh, we, we're not ready. We can't like 
to feature one, feature two, it's not feasible. And then the PM will be like, but we have to launch in three weeks. So why don't you strip down your design? So what happens is you like start cutting corners and what you're left with is like, like an old frail version or whatever your actual vision was. And then obviously that develops that hatred towards the developers because they didn't let you create your amazing stuff. But on the other hand, if you onboard developers from the early on, right? So maybe invite them for one of your research interviews or even when you're making like that black and white uh, mock-up or like just doodling, like just include them in those conversations or share with them throughout the process because early on they let you know this is actually probably not feasible or okay this is interesting i'll start my research so that by the time you've developed their design i will know and i would have learned how to you know kind of back that up from like a technology standpoint so instead of letting them know right in the end and then having to strip down your design i believe in actually building the best possible design along with them and obviously, like, don't settle for everything they say, say, do your own background, try and study up about new material libraries, new component libraries, just like new technology out there to support your design. But essentially, what I'm trying to say is like, push the envelope with them, but like, don't drop it so that your design essentially floats and takes off from there. Um, and then along with the front end developers, you also have tech leads, which these are guys who are more specialized in a particular technology, be it AR or artificial intelligence. Um, I work in genetics, so sometimes these guys are scientists and I end up working with them. So it can be different based on what project you're on or what organization you work with. So when you're working with all of these people, especially when you're working remote and people are on different parts of the world, how does that work? Right, so you have a product requirement document, um, and I'll jump to it. I'll sh I'll share an example in a minute, uh, but that product requirement document basically becomes the starting point for most projects, right? Like that is your go-to document uh, for developers, for designers, for PMs to understand what the requirement is. Um, and once that is established, people use Jira, Trello, or at Frog we even use like a physical whiteboard and we use posted at tickets. So sometimes it's formal, sometimes it's informal, but you break down the task for yourself and for everyone else on the team and try to stay on track for that final goal. Um, and then there are obviously tools like Slack. Now there's Envision, there's Figma, which we just used, or Jira, which is used for more of those, you know, constant check-ins. Jira is amazing, like I said, to always keep sharing with your developers. They love Jira, at least in my company, they do. Find out what your developers love and try to have conversations with them through that medium. Um, Tess, if we can stop the, or pause the recording, then I'm happy to share. Mostly from like a research and interaction design perspective. So first one, which is when you're identifying new opportunities, right? So this is more opportunistic. It's more immersive and broad when you're answering questions like how do millennials tackle finances? So projects like these come up when your organization wants to diversify or you know, capture new markets. Then they ask you to go broad, they ask you to go deep, and you know, you're trying to really uncover what is, what is the next big thing your company can launch. Uh, then there is the design new features or new tools. Uh, this is more on like, you do quantitative and qualitative research, you do task-based inquiry, uh, you design specific workflows. And an example of this is like, okay, I'm already a bank. We already have a website, but I want to create this website targeting towards millennials, right? So have a particular user group in mind. You want to update your website so that it attracts millennials. So you, your user research is more focused. The designs you come up with has more foundation laid out for itself. And then the third type is update an, an existing project, right? So this is mostly applicable for, research, uh, for mature products. So if there is a tool that your organization already has running for three or four years and everybody started to realize that, okay, it's getting old, you know, it's a bit wonky. How do we update it? You don't necessarily know which direction it needs to be updated in. So you conduct usability studies, you conduct testing on that, interact with users, um, and you can set up goals for yourself like, oops, sorry, you can set up goals for yourself like, okay, redesign an efficient account opening experience, right? So I already have that process in place, but I want to make it more efficient just in two or three steps or in five minutes or the 10 minutes it takes right now. 
So then you study that particular workflow and then you decide mockups based on whatever your learnings are. So these are the three types, at least I've seen mostly in my experience, but I'm happy to hear if any one of you has worked on any fourth or fifth type as well. Or if these make sense, give me like a yes in the chat or something like that. If any of you have worked on similar projects, like type out like a why or something in your chat. Yeah, Shal just dropped in a question. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah, I was wondering what is mixed media design um, in the opportunity phase? Oh, so that basically means uh, absolutely, you don't even have to look at digital design only. You could be designing service or you could be designing a physical product or it could be an interactive installation. So you don't necessarily know what the final outcome is going to be. So these are mostly like blue sky projects. Does that answer your question? Um, yeah, but I'm wondering, um, like it's mentioned in the opportunity phase. So is that the time or the point where we are figuring out what the end result will be? Is that why the term is added? Oh, no. So this is basically like- Because I've heard mixed media research and I actually um, oh. asked my professor, Nathan, uh, about mixed media research and how they have written a book on it. He along with um, Steve Diller. So I was mm -hmm. asking a little more about that. So I've heard mixed media research, but I'm not sure what's mixed media design. Oh, so the way I'm actually using it here is more like the outcome of your design or the platform in which you would be designing could be different. You could come up with like a service model, a business model. You could come up with a website. You could come up with like a physical product for all you care. So it's, it's more of a broader opportunity for you to discover what is that next design that you're going to create. And it's not bounded by any medium as such. Mm -hmm. It's not bounded by just being a digital uh, product or it's not bounded by just being a physical product it could be absolutely anything yeah got it but this is like to be very honest quite rare <laughs> because yeah, i was like, just going to ask yeah. that <laughs> that is a follow-up question that uh did you at frog really get a chance to explore the medium uh or uh, or explore the media because or did it come with the brief as to what the end result would be the opportunity of course you can within that uh, set platform can find but the pl yeah. platform is kind of fixed Right. So I think when uh, I wasn't on that project, but I think it was it had come into conclusion when I just joined Frog and it was a project for a museum. So I think mm -hmm. that was very really open ended and like experimental where they didn't start with like, oh, we are going to have a physical artifact only. So it ended up being this spatial design work. So mm -hmm. I think, like I said, it's, it's rare. It's not for all organizations, but you can expect that to happen in agencies quite often. Mm -hmm. where it like starts to be very broad yeah okay. thanks any anybody else had questions am i thanks purva for pointing that out mm -hmm. okay so when you're working on any of these projects uh this is overall like mostly what the process looks like. I mean, it's obviously different from project to project where you start, how much details you go into, but at a high level, at least this is the process I've mostly followed in my organizations I've worked with. That always like there's an inception uh, of a project. There's a PRD that's created. You conduct research, you identify challenges, insights, um, you design prototypes, you validate them, and then there is a dev handoff. Uh, the reason I'm sharing this is mostly because like what what does the process look like uh, as a hybrid designer right when you're put on like these hybrid projects and I had two examples to share uh, are we still recording if we can pause that uh, there is just like never any research done it, it starts from an assumption and that's quite common too um, I guess that's when you put in your research hand and question the assumption as much as possible I know sometimes it is difficult like you're literally banging against a wall and no one has any answer, right? So yeah. like I said, then I had to like voluntarily look for that scientist in the company and I'll go and ask her. So that was beyond what was expected out of me in that ticket. Uh, I had to like put on like a PM role, reach out to her, talk to her, get those user stories from her. So sometimes you just got to be like flexible enough to experiment, I guess. 
but does this happen often like in the professional field of uh, you know you kind of jumping into a project i'm assuming because it's multiple people working on it, it's not like a class project right? right so does that happen quite often where you kind of get into a stage where you don't start from the scratch yes yes quite often so um at, at least at the beginning so i started with invite 8 months ago right so for the first two or three months i spent just like i was just handed over some of the projects from teams that were not teams from a designer who was leaving right so he she or he had already done some of some of the works and i started from there but i think in the past few months i've started to uh get projects which i'm starting from scratch so it also depends on where you are in your career in that organization depending on that you'll get projects either from inception mode or like probably half baked and then you have to take it up from there and there are always like combinations so like these the, the three projects you're seeing here i was working on them parallelly so there were some projects which like i said the first one i started from inception right i was i was part of it throughout the journey but chain of custody or like the research at invite i i didn't do any research or especially for chain of custody we just did interaction design and then usability testing for it so at any given point there is a chance that you might be parallelly working on different types of projects Okay. Thank you so much. This is this is very reassuring. I I thought I did my project all wrong, so this is kind of reassuring to know that no. these are other ways of approaching things as well. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Always. I think there is no wrong way I think to do design as long as you're following a basic fundamental process, you're generally in the right direction. So no. Uh any other questions uh This is great guys thanks for always like i think it's helpful it gives me validation that what i'm sharing is actually helpful <laughs> but yeah it's it's officially the time for q and a if anyone has more questions okay yeah i have a question yeah uh i so we we are also in the user testing phase for our social lab project Huh. and i was just interested to know uh, what were the tools that um, you used for your usability testing yeah and uh, i had another question second question was um uh, you mentioned something about the core user need method that oh, yeah. um, um that you were you conducted on envision brainstorm with your peer mm-hmm. i'd be interested to understand you know how you use that because like you said it's going to be very often that we join a project you know in the in the middle and really catching up to understanding user needs and you just did this with your peer to understand uh everything that they have identified so i'm i'm very interested to know that i think it would be super helpful sure okay so your first question first i think i had a slide on that maybe I, oh here it is okay um let's unskip it and present it but this is some of the tools i've been using while conducting like remote research or remote usability testing in like covid times so mostly uh, because uh, most of my users are internal like i said so they're uh, people who currently work at invite we just do zoom calls uh, and do usability testing through that so i share my uh, envision mockups or then if there is a develop mockup that is partially developed by the front end developer if i'm working with them then we share that uh, with the user um, and then we have these micro tasks that are created i'm sure you guys create like a discussion guide or task guide for usability testing so yeah, yeah. essentially we we share that uh, with the user and then share the envision link and ask them to sh- share their screen back it's a lot of sharing and resharing going on okay uh, but uh, i think uh, keep keeping all your material ready in cases like this also accounting for like any technical glitches like sometimes they are unable to share or uh, they don't support in vision website links so for example so always like be prepared um, mm-hmm. another formal method uh, that we've also used it respondent.io or validately i think they are really good these guys help with identifying users externally if you're looking for a particular demographic or persona um and then you can set up interviews with them so these are uh these are uh, i think what is the word i forgot the word but these are more like e- external as in you don't necessarily know you you don't go scouting for them or recruiting them mm-hmm. like right so it's always like you get a broad range of feedback because they're obviously representing various cultures ethnicities uh, academic backgrounds so on and so forth 
so that's also helpful okay they have participants is it yes they have recruited pre recruited mm-hmm. participants i'm i'm guessing this would be um, a paid platform uh yes yeah okay yes okay that's right uh then i i'm not sure what I, it was called user testing or something like that there was mm-hmm. another website when i was in school and they had like a, a like a free uh three they you'll get three or four respondents or something like that not everyone but you can conduct some basic usability testing even like on a free account so maybe that's something you want to check out if you want to use it for your social lab project okay okay that helps okay <laughs> that's very helpful sneha huh? thanks yeah, no worries uh, and your second question okay user need uh, the yeah okay like wow Yeah, my presentation decided to log me out at the exact minute I moved to it, but I'm back and let's go to where is that? Oh no, it was this one. Started. Oh, can we stop recording? Sorry. Or pause it if you don't cover a section as long as your questions are answered. That's important. Okay. um now this is more specific to like roles and responsibilities and actually how to become uh, like how do you find a job uh, we've kind of covered some of this in all our only your questions and the discussions uh but this is one of my favorite quotes about research which is like designing without research is like getting into a taxi and like just saying drive and you're not in a hollywood movie the driver is not going to know where you have to be dropped off which lane needs to be taken like there's no magic happening there this is reality so essentially you have to have that conversation right with the driver whoever your user is like buddy where do you want me? like where do you want to go you know what what direction do you want me to take you in like how much time do you have you have to have those conversations and without that i feel like you can build the fanciest vehicle which has the best technology but it's not going to function it's not going to be scalable it's not going to be long term so i really believe in research so i'm always like vouching for it and like i i i sometimes google oh product projects that have failed because they lacked research and i'm like yes <laughs> but that that part aside um essentially as a researcher so especially when you're in a hybrid role i've started to realize you have to wear different caps but you also have to ensure you're not biasing your one role on because of the other so when i'm a researcher you can't be thinking oh this is an interesting insight because that will lead me to this so and so design when you're a researcher try and like box yourself in that role um i know it can be like very ambiguous it you're basically there are very few solid pillars for you to like land on and like walk on but that i feel like is the most interesting part of research uh, you're always questioning assumptions you're dealing with ambiguity um overall technically as a, uh, i guess your responsibility is about creating those research plans i uh, recruiting uh, conducting that research whether it's remote or in person uh, through that research synthesizing that to identify user stories user scenarios user requirements um success criteria like we discussed earlier and then all of that into one final research report right and while you're doing this you're obviously always advocating for the final user but don't forget about your business needs i think this is another bias especially when you're in school like we're like the final user is god and i am designing for that one god 
And that's not true. Like you're in an organization, there are business needs, there are needs of your internal stakeholders. And it's important as a researcher for you to open up your mind and be cognizant of their requirements as well to design and deliver a product that actually functions, right? So always also look at your internal folks as your users when you're working on something and keep an open mind. Don't like alienate yourself from like, I am like the Masiha for the users and you know nothing, like that's not gonna be helpful. You'd be surprised by how much information PMs have just because like they're so embedded like in a particular role. And then obviously interaction designer, I, I think most of y'all would be aware of what this is, like since y'all are studying interaction design, uh, but mostly when you're designing to build for a particular needs, you already have like a lot of foundation to work off of. You have the research documents, you have the elements of the system, which is uh, if you go to any organization, if they have a digital product or a website, they will have a style guide, right? They'll have all their components and uh, interaction uh, modules kind of ready for you to play around with and build that mock-up. You can obviously add to that library, but there is going to be something ready for you unless you're working on a startup and you're the first designer, which is also cool. <laughs> uh, but as an interactive designer, obviously always refer to the research report. Like I guess what we just discussed, right? Like even if you land on the interaction section, don't forget about all the work that might have happened before you. Um, understand the landscape of the problem, uh, and the most important, use those research stories, especially if you're part of that entire gamut or end-to-end -end process, use those research stories to actually make a connection. You'll be surprised. And I'm sure you guys have learned this in your storytelling class. Like, you know, whenever you're sharing a new concept, it's so powerful to have like a user quote or a user story. It helps audience to connect with what you're designing, right? Especially I feel like uh, when you're working on more uh, practical functional tools like like the like the uh, reagent page that I shared with you guys, which is more of a dry. It'll probably fall in that dry space. But using quotes for projects like this can actually help enhance and elevate your pitch or your final share out sessions. So always do that. And this is uh, I think goes back to the discussions we were having earlier. I'm not going to like uh, spend too much time, but how do you identify a hybrid role, right? So. This is a synopsis of two or three roles that I was looking at when I was hired at Invite. So in the description, look for words like, oh, you'd be understanding empathy around user needs, or you would be responsible for like search portals for programs. You would be responsible for creating wireframes and prototyping design concepts or analyzing customer feedback. So when I read this, I was like, okay, so they want me to do some research and they want me to make some mockups. That means this is the right kind of hybrid for me. And the first exercise we did where we listed down the skill sets, I think it, it's this is the time when you'd try and map out if you know the skill sets you have matches what is the description in the response uh, on LinkedIn, essentially. So what you will do, and there's also a section of what you bring, right? So you bring wireframing skills, you bring skills of conducting research, uh, you bring obviously bring skills of like communication and collaboration with multidisciplinary teams. So I guess look for these keywords when you're looking for hybrid roles. And this is almost, I think the last section, but do you guys have any questions before we jump uh, to the last part? Okay. So this is the last part. Now this is uh, nothing to do with necessarily hybrid design, but I just wanted to share about some of the challenges you might face. And I don't mean design challenges, but these are more collaboration challenges or team related challenges, right? Like what does the real world look like? Um, and similar to what we were discussing where yes, you will get projects where you're landed at the end of the phase or like they are half baked. Similarly, you would also hear sentences like, oh, research takes too long, like let's not do it. Or you know, design this new dashboard demo for me tomorrow, and you're like, what? You you give giving me 24 hours to make a completely new demo, um, or then this is this is my weak point. Whenever I hear this, I'm like, I'm not the guy for you. But can you make this beautiful? And I'm like, no, <laughs> I actually cannot. I'm not good at visual design. Like, but I think um, over time you realize when you hear statements like these. I mean. This is coming from people who are not necessarily aware of what we have to offer. Um, so when you hear something like design this dashboard for me tomorrow, 
be like, okay, but who who are we demoing this to? Like, who's my audience, right? And what do you mean design this dashboard? Can you break it down for me? And through the conversations, you'll actually realize that they just want, they want to show two features, right? And that's easy to build like in a few hours, right? If the component libraries are ready. So what I'm trying to say is like, when you get such roadblocks, try to break them by putting in your research and your design flexible scope. And this is what I mean by turn them into your internal users. Try to understand why they're making you do this so that you know you can actually uh, be someone they reach out to when they're in a fix. Like, don't be that person being like, oh, I can't design this like in a day. Like, this is not possible. Design can't do it. But if you actually help them out in some sort of a way, next time they have a conversation with you, you can ask for more time because they know what you're capable of, especially when you're like new in an organization. Similar goes for like lack of requirements. If you think there's a lack, ask for those. Um, feedback overload. This is also very common where, you know, as a, as design, I think as designers, we're visual thinkers. So when we get a requirement, we're able to like visualize what it's going to look like, but that's not true for everyone. Right. So this goes back to what I was saying, show people your initial sketches, show them like your mock-ups, your final designs so that they're on that journey with you. And you don't get like extremely, uh, you know, different feedback at the end of the road. Um, and the last part is like, yes, design and research is very personal. It's subjective. Most of the things we do are like, we fall in love with it, it becomes our baby, and then it's difficult to get feedback. But as a designer, I think when you're speaking the language of emotions, you're speaking the language of aesthetics, which can be subjective, always support it with facts, with numbers, especially if you're part of the research team, get out those codes, do some quant research, do some surveys to have some facts and figures around it. I think that definitely helps establish your credibility. And that's about it. This is just like tips on like how to establish yourself in a new company, but feel like I've already covered this, like make devs your framework of best friends, sorry, framework. Uh, go introduce yourself when you're joining a new company, like put yourself out there on different channels. The reason I'm sharing this was like, I was working in India, it was slightly different. I was more like, I'm just going to do my design and stay in that phase and work always came to me. But I realized out here, especially in an agency, you had to be heard, right? You had to constantly be sharing something. You had to constantly be talking about something. And I think it's more helpful for me in the long run. Like first I started doing it because everyone was doing it. But then I realized, oh, I actually learned so much because I'm trying to read new articles or I'm trying to understand from some things from the devs perspective. So new culture, new learnings. But that's it. Last Q&A. I think we're just about time, but we have some time for more questions. Um, I had another question, Sneha. Um, yeah. There are some uh, job postings where you see a quantitative user researcher, spe 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 specifically including that term quantitative. Um, so what can you expect in a role like that? And is it possible that we should apply for it if we're we are, we are really just interested in design research in general? Um, again, it depends on like what they mean by quantitative. Sometimes if it's like based on surveys and like basic, uh, like go for example, data analytics that Google offers, right? Mm -hmm. That is something you can quickly learn or any analytical, right? You can quickly learn and then use that because it's a supporting medium for your research. But obviously there is design research involved. So if all those components are involved, sure, I think you should be able to apply for it. Like there are some things you would already have as skills and there's some things you'll probably have to learn from like a data uh, quant perspective. But if it is probably heavily just on quant, then it's something you might have to question yourself if that's something you're even interested in as a design researcher, because then that is more about stats. Um, and, you know, it gets more into like the technical and academic part of it than the, the user research part of it. Got it. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, recruiters are always good for questions like these. So mm -hmm. if you have your initial recruitment call, uh, calls, yeah. ask them this, like, okay, can you give me an example of what quant research looks like? What tools do, do they use? Ask them what are the designers currently doing? That'll give you an idea of what they would expect from you. Yeah, so there are some like just on LinkedIn because like all of us are just like looking at these job postings on LinkedIn. Some of them uh, are titled as uh, 
quantitative UX uh, researcher or like quantitative researcher. So I was just wondering if you should even open and look at those. Always, always open and look at it. And if you have like a LinkedIn connection in that organization, reach out to them. If you're not speaking to recruiters yet, reach mm -hmm. out to them and understand. Like I can give you a perspective of what quant researchers look at in detail, but I don't know what it looks like at Facebook or what it looks like at some other company, right? So yeah, got it. <laughs> Any other questions? Curious. So do you guys have class after this? No? Okay. It's like... I just want to say thank you, Sneha. This is really thank nice. Like, I really so much. so much from the session. Really appreciate it. Thank um, you. Agree. Sneha, <laughs> another question. Yeah. <laughs> so, so, um, so when in, in your early days, when you just started out fresh from college, when you were applying, how many skills you used to, when you used to look at job description and what you bring, the requirements and what you bring, um, what was like the percentage of match that you thought this matches with my skills and then you would go apply? Was it 50%? Was it 80%? Was it 100%? So if I'm honest, I think for my first job, which was Frog, it was probably 50%. Because they mm. were looking for someone more specialized in interaction and visual design skills. And I had interaction and research skills, okay. uh, right? So it was 50%. Uh, and I guess that was one reason where I, I kind of, after a year, I was like, no, I want something more research-based and not just interaction. So when I started looking for my second job, I tried to ensure that there's at least a 70% match. So that once I'm doing it, I'm actually enjoying it as much. So if that answers your question so it's it's different yeah. depending on what you're looking for at that point yeah so what i was trying to understand is even if there is a 50 percent match i should just go apply. ahead and apply okay <laughs> I mean, what's the worst thing that's going to happen right you'll just learn yeah. about the way that organization works and you might feel like you have 50 percent match but once you speak to someone you're like oh there's actually i know more like it's not a 50 it's probably a 70 so or sometimes we're like, no, this is like a 10% match. I, I I don't want to do this. Like, this is not for me. Mm -hmm. So always apply and like reach out to people who work there to understand what that role actually means. Like if you're not getting a good understanding from the description, I would always recommend reach out to people and speak to people who already work there. Okay. That would be the recruiters or the uh, designers no, themselves? Fellow designers. Because I'm not sure recruiters are generally like open to speaking before they're like, mm. they've actually reached out to you. So, I mean, uh, CCA alumni group is quite huge now. We have designers, almost most companies around in the Bay Area, at least. So it should be easy for you to like ask for an informational if you're really curious. Okay. Okay, got it. Thanks. So um, I'm curious, did the percentage... Did did 50% uh, increase during your time at Frog by the end of, of it? Were you, were you sort of, because you said you want, you were sure you wanted to do more research, but um, were you more comfortable with visual design? How did that work? Uh, yeah, I think uh, research, not so much. So it didn't transition into a lot of projects where it was the kind of research I was interested in. It was mostly secondary research. Uh, but I think my skills for interaction design actually grew when I was working at Frog because we ended up working on, like I said, some really big brands and they wanted like some best in practice, like interaction websites and amazing like visual designs. So I think that aspect really grew, but sadly the research part didn't get that much attention. So I was like, oh, I want a research role. <laughs> So out here, how many of you guys are like actually looking for like a specialized role? Just like raise your hand. I mean, on people who are showing videos, otherwise you can show this. What do you mean by specialized, sorry? As in like a specialized in visual design or that, like a right. specialist interaction designer or a content strategist period, like okay. in an I think I'm scenario. looking at research, so that's specialized. <laughs> Yay, okay, so Shalvi, Sherwin, specialized. I see Hardik nodding, okay, specialized. Nice. For and, now. And hybrids? 
Hi, Brit. <laughs> cool. Okay. Awesome. Are there questions? Okay. I think, yeah, we're a little bit or about over. I mean, if people aren't joining, I have more questions and Sina's willing to give us a little bit more by all means. But otherwise, I think we're about there. And this was wonderful. So thank you all for being so involved. And thank you so much for your time. Sina. This was incredible. Yeah, glad. glad yeah, what's I the, it. sorry, I was just asking, what's the best way to reach out and contact you if we want oh. more information? Uh, I've shared the, it in the deck. Yeah, I've shared yeah. it in the deck. I've shared my email ID and like also LinkedIn. So just DM me on LinkedIn or drop in an email. Yeah, we'll share the deck. Um, absolutely. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, guys. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. Bye. Thank you. All the best. Bye, everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you.